Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Coach. Doctor, Sean, how are you? Hey, good morning, Jeff. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. So uh, today's class, we're going to focus on VA errors you can appeal. Um, but before we get in, we're going to give everyone about five minutes to roll in here. So I guess to, to get started, just want to know the audience in the room. Kind of want to find out where everyone served, when they served, and uh, what, what time you served. Um, so, so Jeff, if you want to kick us off, I'd like to know a little bit more about you, what oh. branch do you serve in and when do you serve? Once and always brother, once and always, once a Marine, always a Marine, uh, joined the Marine Corps 2009 as a butter bar. I think you and I shared that same time. I think you're still doing it so we can get to that and you can share your experiences currently serving, by the way, thank you for still doing that, Sean. I do appreciate that. Um, was artillery officer for four years, active duty. Uh, got out, did the reserves for six years. Uh, I am 100% permanent and total disabled veteran. Uh, and I currently live in Mexico. Uh, so if we have questions on that, we'll get to that part. But in a nutshell, that's what I did about 10 years. I uh, did one deployment to the Republic of Georgia under what is known as the GDP, the Georgian Deployment Program. Great experience. Honest to God, a great experience. And uh, now I've been with this beautiful organization, this beautiful family for about a year and a half. Similar, I think you and I have around the same time, but uh, great to be here. Great to be uh, still serving and teaching. So I hope you're doing well as, as well. Anybody else out there, if you're my Marines, let me see you guys. Semper Files, like uh, Coach or Dr. Sean said, let's see where you're from. All right. We got some fellow Army in the house. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a fellow Army vet myself. Um, I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm still in, but, uh, started off in uh, 2013 was a, uh, uh, I, I enlisted as a medic and then went through the whole ROTC thing, got my degree commissioned and, uh, still in currently in command. I'm also hundred percent disabled, um, but still serving there. There's some, some nuance there. We can, we can talk about it at a later point. Um, but yeah, it's great. Started off here as a client, moved in as a coach. Absolutely love VACI and taking care of veterans. It's great. Appreciate working with you. And now we got people waking up. We got our Californians starting to wake up. I saw George Jorge. I saw him out there, Semper Fi. I saw the Army. I'm Army trained, like a basic basic Marine Corps officer. But I, I went to six-month all-expense paid vacation to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. I don't know if I'd call it a vacation, but it was still a good time. Uh, Lawton's well, great, good. man. Honestly, it wasn't bad because we were there in the winter to the springtime. So the winds did come sweeping down the plane uh, there in Oklahoma. So no twisters. But when I was there, it was a good time. And I so we got it. I see Rick, Rick Dowdy, Semper Fi brother. Oh, I see that number. Congratulations, Rick. I'll talk to you at a different point. But hey, anybody else on here, any branch, Air Force, Army, Navy, Air Force. We got a Coast lot of Army. Marines in here, Jeff. You brought, you brought a following. Uh, that is what I would call it. We're almost to a platoon. Let's see if we can get to platoon strength, gentlemen and ladies. If you're the Navy, we might need a ride. And Army, we may need a ride as well. Air Force, we might need a ride there as well. They can they can airlift us. But it's good to see you all. Thanks for coming and being here with us. Uh, especialmente por los veteranos. Uh, se puede hablar en español. Mucho gusto. Bienvenidos. Y gracias por su tiempo aquí. Tenemos uh, clases, tenemos uh, entrenadores para ti. Tú quieres hablar o trabajo con un, un uh, entrenador. Eh, aquí es el vínculo. Necesita ayuda con su reclamo. Puede comenzar gratis por uh, hoy haciendo clic en el vínculo bajo la pregunta. So if you guys are there, you need some uh, guidance. There you go. There's that link. Oh, man, we got everybody in here. I like this. This is this is what motivates me. Still motivated, still serving. All right, I see Oklahoma. All right, I see you, Jerry. I lived in Oklahoma about six years. I was a, a police officer down there in Norman, so it was uh, good times. Good times. All right. Well, I, I got eleven oh five, Jeff. We can we can kick her off if we can get eleven oh five. We'll get the ball there. rolling. Let's go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll take a read of it. You want me to read it for you? Because we already put it up. So uh, disclaimer, we are not accredited agents, uh, VSOs, attorneys, or any other um, entity recognized by the Department of Veterans Affairs, and we are not affiliated with the VA in any way. 
Uh, VA Claims Insider is an education-based coaching consulting company for disabled veterans exploring eligibility for increased VA disability benefits and who wish to learn uh, more about that process. VA Claims Insider also connects veterans with vetted independent medical professionals in our referral network for medical examinations and independent medical opinions, or known as an IMO, uh, for a wide range of disability conditions. So thank you for that one. And, and just a, a little bit about our program. So, so we kind of focus on, on three base criteria. So it, it's focused on strategy, education, and medical evidence. Those are the, the big thing when it comes to the elite program. So we offer one-on-one -on -one coaching, uh, strategy sessions, claim submission prep, um, and then preparation for the compensation and pension examination, which we can get into at a later point. Uh, so we offer 30 minutes free discovery calls, um, some VACI blogs, and then Jeff, I, I, I know you're familiar with the uh, Spanish Facebook lives, uh, if, if you wouldn't mind translating for the group. Mm -hmm. No, tenemos uh, tres clases cada día en la semana para ti. Es una razón uh, de ed educación, All right? Uh, entonces, tú se puede recibir uno a uno. Uh, uh, yeah, I can't remember that part. So I'm still learning my Spanish. I live in Mexico. I live in Puerto Vallarta. I've been here for about four years, pero todavía aprendiendo el idioma. Pero tenemos un proceso por uh, estar su entrenador, uh, uno a uno, uh, trabajando con lo, el veterano. Y también uh, tenemos tres clases cada día, yo dijo ahorita, y es una metodología por su claim. Okay, so we've got it for you. And like... Uh, I can't, I don't know, doctor or coach. I'm going to go with coach. I'm going to go coach Sean. I like doctor though. Again, congratulations for that Which one. Hat. <laughs> Which hat? Which hat or helmet? Come on now, still serving. Um, but absolutely, we have, it's the same for what it is for the non-English or the, the English speaking. So if you have that question, let me know. We have that information for you. And like you said, strategy, education, and methodology, that's that's the biggest piece here is the education piece. And that's hopefully what we'll get into today for you um, and share some information and knowledge that I know you've gone through, uh, Coach, as well as myself. Yeah, and, and so th this class, so so last week we had two of our senior veteran coaches, uh, Daryl and, and Caleb. Mm -hmm. they, they spoke on the three kinds of reviews. And so for this, we're taking well, it a step further and, and we're, we're talking reviews? about... VA errors that you can appeal. Um, so focusing more on on typically what's called a higher level review, um, which is where most would fall into. But um, it may, if it's been over a year since the claim has been decided, you may want to go into a supplemental. Um, so we're, we're going to look at, you know, what happened with your claim. Uh, so So what went wrong and what can you do about it? So with that, Jeff, um, I'll, I'll turn it over to you and we can get we can get started here. No, absolutely. And those three things that you talked about last or they talked about last week, this uh, Daryl and um, Caleb. Right. So Semper Fi, that was a Marine team. You're welcome. Hoorah. So they, you said supplemental. HLR. And what was the other appeal? Oh, those are the two. And, and, and right? then they also talked so, about the traditional filing. But OK, good. Good. And now that, the reason I bring that up is that's exactly a caveat into what we're doing here today. Okay. We're going to break it down. The first thing that I will say about anything with this process, you know, you work with your coach, you do it, you're, you know, you work with information that you've got. The biggest thing that you need to know first and foremost, going through the gate is advocacy of your own claim. Okay. You know, if you're going to do a fully developed claim and you're working with your coach, going through that step, advocate, advocate, advocate. OK, you don't want to do this blindly. You don't want to do this just not smart. You want to make sure that you put as much effort into it as you can work with your coach. You know, we can't do the work right. You're going to ultimately you're ultimately doing the work. You're out there doing the push ups, doing the sit ups in terms of VA claims. Right. So let's let's get down into it. Uh, I think the first one I, you and I talked about this at least a couple of times getting ready for this class um, is incorrect consideration of evidence. Right. You you work the process. Um, let's just say you did a supplemental claim. OK, you got you have your IMO. 
independent medical opinion or a nexus, whatever you have, you have new and relevant information that you're getting ready to submit to the VA. Well, you submitted everything that they asked for and that they need, but they just didn't even take a look at it, right? So that that's kind of the case with some nexus letters, whether it's a DBQ from a private medical doctor or, you know, we uh, Telemedica, right? They're, they're in our um, network of independent medical providers. They provide some documents such as that. And if you submit that to the VA and then the VA sends you back one of those AMA decision letters and they say, not good enough. Then what do you do? Well, like you were talking about, we have the ability to do an HLR or to do another supplemental claim. So if you submitted a document and the VA says, well, it doesn't, contain the information that we're looking for. However, it does, right? We've got to remember that the um, that private IMO is going to carry a little bit more probative value, right? Uh, I think probative value, you know, me being a Marine, sometimes you got to look up these big words, right? That's a joke, everybody. But the probative value, what that means in VA talk, I took this directly from the, their website. It, it says that it's it has sufficient weight either by itself or in combination with other evidence to persuade the decision maker about that uh, about that information, right? So does your information that you provide give them enough information with which to decide on? And your, probe, your, your IMO is going to do that. It should if it is done correctly, right? <clears throat> uh, the other thing I would say is that if the VA examiner is just not like they're not addressing anything in your letter, anything in your evidence, or they're just picking and choosing what they want to see and what they want to hear. These are the things. So when I'm talking about the, these are the ideas, these concepts are things that you can appeal, right? You can write them in a higher level review letter, right? You can petition on the 2148 or 4138 if you need to put in a statement and lining it out and saying, hey, I submitted A, B, and C to you, and they just didn't take into account any of that information. Um, so then the next thing I would say is that they didn't document the evidence provided. I, ha I work with individuals, and I've had a couple of my clients that they literally come back to me and say, I turned everything in. I still got denied. They're saying that they didn't receive my information. Now, I don't know if that ever happened to you, uh, Coach Sean, but I mean, it happened to me where, you know, some guys say, I turned in my information, I had, I brought my, I brought my IMO with me to the doctor's appointment and they gave it to the doctor and the doctor said, well, I never received this initially. So that could be an, inf an issue with the information system, like you uploaded it, whether you did a fully developed claim, whether you faxed it, whether you did the centralized mail portal. So it could be that, but it could also be the fact that they just didn't even read it. Um, so that's the, those are the first two concepts getting into it. And then also uh, a, a bigger piece, this is a big piece, not getting the information that is necessary. So problems obtaining the necessary information. So going into that a little bit, what is that? I think, I know when I did my first claim, I thought, hey, I need to submit all my medical record. And I did. I submitted all of my medical record, right? No, I just needed to submit the information that they asked for, that they're needing, right? The one that says that there's a diagnosis. And if it is in your STR or your uh, SMR, right, your service medical or your service treatment record, it's going to have that date time group that says, you know, rhinitis or broken leg, plantar fasciitis, right? So that's the documents that you need. You don't need to provide them all the information, but if you get into it and you don't have that information, I know a lot of the time us veterans never went to medical, right? It's, you know, fake it till you make it, suck it up, take two ibuprofen, change your socks and you'll be healed. At least that's what they told us in the Marine Corps. Um, but the biggest thing to know that the VA, uh, they have a duty to assist. OK, the duty to assist is they have their they have access to your DD-214 and they have at least if they they'll try, I think they say at least two to three, two times to make an attempt to get your uh, medical record if you haven't provided that to them. Now, there's other cases, too. I don't know if you've ever had this, uh, Coach Sean, um, where individuals have. Uh, let's say there's like an issue with, uh, well, there's this thing at this time. It was 
due to a security clearance issue, whether it's a nuclear sub or it's like experimental or something like that, there may be an issue with records. Uh, the VA, uh, of course, you have to authorize them. That's why you have to fill out a, I think it's a 4142A or whatever the release of authorization to allow the VA then to go on your behalf to either get those private medical records or to have to go to the service that you're requesting. Um, I know there is, there's time frames, reporting time frames that, hey, I'm looking to get information from the U.S. Coast Guard regarding some operation back in 1992, for example. I don't know. Well, the VA can do that, but you have to understand that the Department of Veterans Affairs is a lot different than the U.S. Coast Guard, and they may have to go through at least a couple of channels to see if they can even get those records. Sometimes they're successful, sometimes they're not. So there is the release of authorization and information gathering by the VA on that regard. Um, do you have any anything to add to those first three things that we went through with regard to not reviewing the evidence properly? Um, or the document isn't per, like you, they're not using all of the evidence or partial evidence or even obtaining of that evidence. Do you have anything to add to that, brother? Yeah, I'd say on, on the partial evidence side, um, I, I see it happen all the time. And I, I know you do, too, um, when it comes down to, to just working, working with with veterans um, where somebody will see you'll submit something. Right. Um, but it'll ultimately go to the VA and it just won't be considered or it, it will be considered, but it won't be reflected on the decision letter that you will receive from the VA, meaning ultimately it was not considered. Um, you, at least you can't prove that it was considered. And so that, that would likely trigger, and I'll get into this in a second, um, what, what, what's called the duty to assist, um, or, or it'll trigger another uh, compensation and pension examination because of a faulty exam. Um, because ultimately, you're due uh, your fair shake when it comes down to, to being thoughtfully reviewed for, for consideration. And when it comes down to the, the independent medical opinions having pro more probative value, uh, th this is all about service connection, right? Um, so this is a, a thoughtful review from a medical provider who's licensed uh, to practice medicine in your state that's stating, you know, they're drawing the connection from, from where you are currently now all the way back to when you served. And they, 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 they detailed exactly how, you know, whatever the case may be, however, whatever condition you're looking for, whether it's musculoskeletal, mental health, um, it's a respiratory condition, whatever the cause is, they're drawing that connection to service. And so you're, you're submitting your best product, but that evidence was not considered. So that's, that's your smoking gun going into the case that was not considered uh, going into it. Um, so that would, that would definitely skew, skew um, a claim in favor of the VA in this case um, would be the, the biggest thing that I see. Yeah. And the other thing I want to point out, um, even though I am, I like to think as a Marine, we are supermen and women. Um, I think us as veterans, I know I have done this as well, that, wait, what? I, I served, this happened, I should be automatically connected for it. It's a bureaucratic process. I mean, it's set, there's, there's a system in place. And honestly, you follow the system, it works, you know, like, when I was in the Marine Corps, we have 155, the triple sevens, right? Follow the system, follow the manual. Thank you, Army, for teaching me on that. And you learn how to employ that in accordance with its capabilities. It's going to work. But it also has the manual, how to break it down if there's an issue and how to fix it. Well, there's human error that we need to take into account there. Yes, there are doctors that make mistakes. So you could provide a great product. Right. You can provide a great document that you either got from a private doctor or, I, you know, you go into Telemedica, you went to a psych exam. It's listed. Everything's in there. It shows service connection. It's at least as likely than not. Your symptoms are accounted for. You're you're like, man, this is a slam dunk. I'm going in, you know, I'm in the red zone, you know, three, three, third down, one yard left. Right. But then it goes to the doctor at the exam. Well, there's a procedural thing, too that that goes from the doctor then to a rate of reviewer. Okay. So there's, there's levels in there, right? You can have everything that you want, but I, I see what you're saying. You can have all the information, the probative value, but then you can also have the human error. I just wanted to put that out there and just let everybody else know that there's that human error. So thank you for that. 
And then you said you're going to speak on duty to assist. Yeah, just so you you brought up you brought up a great point, and and uh, the the one thing I would caveat on that, and it it can work both ways. So I I want to to state the advantage, and this is where buddy letters come in. Uh, the advantage to buddy letters um, is in case where uh, Jeff you, you just brought up, um, you're having difficulties from in service. Um, a, a, a documenting exactly what happens. So this is where you have you're building lay evidence. Um, through another service member who served or service members um, through a, a time period that you would have served commonly in, in a certain area at a certain point in time. And so they're able to document exactly what happened and that builds the, the evidence for your case. Um, so you can establish that nexus. It's um, it, lay evidence is huge. Sometimes it may, you know, that's the whole quantitative versus qualitative. Is it, is it good to throw a, a bunch of cannon fodder at them? Or is it good to just give them that one little piece? Um, no, I agree with you. You know, I've had examples of individuals that know they have a medical diagnosis, but there's no nexus. They say it happened in service. Now we're not saying to create it out of thin air. That's fraud. That's wrong. You can't know. No. Talk about an actual event that happened in service and use the lay statement. Use that, you know, have that discussion. You know, if you, I mean, I can tell, I've never been to combat, but I can tell you I have, a lot of veterans that I work with, but I also know some fr uh, personal friends of mine, IED blasts. I, I, I'm, I'm going to bring it up just because you can get rated for a TBI, right? But that kind of information may not be in your medical record, especially when you're on in a kinetic environment such as Iraq, Afghanistan, even as far back as, yes, Somalia, Vietnam War, Gulf War One, Desert Storm, Desert Shield. So... Nail is hit on the head and the proverbial horse, I don't like to say, you know, beaten because of PETA, but I'm telling you, it is, those are very important. So do not, do not, please do not uh, forget about your play statements. Thank you for that, by the way. Yeah, quick disclosure on that. Um, you, you can go awry with those really quickly, though. And, and that's why, you know, working with a coach, um, the, the whole, uh, all the, the, it, it's, value added just so you can get a second opinion on when it would add value and when it wouldn't. Um, mostly because these can go awry. Uh, for instance, Jeff just explained with an IED blast, maybe you're going for a PTSD claim because you got in, in some type of vehicle rollover. And so you're having a, a buddy lay statement to document exactly what happened. Well, you, you're also going for a migraine claim. Um, migraines typically rated or at the maximum is 50%. Well, now inside the letter, they document TBI. Um, so in, inside the letter, they see the, the rating for a TBI and then that's what they're, where they're trying to go with it. Uh, well, they're, they're going to read your letter. Um, at least they're, they're likely to read your letter, which could trigger an examination for TBI, which ultimately could pigeonhole your ultimate goal yeah. of getting to, to headaches at 50% because that that's going to trigger that process potentially before you're ready. There's a lot of technicality in this, um, Thank but you for the clarification. when, no, when, when you're true. looking to do it, um, it, it's why it's good to have a strategy in mind, um, and be educated on it and then have the medical evidence that supports it all the way along the path versus just going with a buddy letter and, and, and submitting it and making sure what's in the buddy letter is, is exactly what you need. Agreed. I appreciate that. And duty to assist. You want to speak on that? Cause I know we were kind of talking about some of the the things like with evidence, you know, they're not considering all having a little bit. Now I think duty to assist, you can speak on that a little bit better than I, but I can definitely speak on it as well. Yeah. So typically that that's triggered when uh, the, the VA notates an error. So uh, I see this a lot, particularly in higher level reviews. Um, so you file a higher level review, there was an error note, noted in the process and the, the VA recognizes it and Ultimately, it's going to trigger some kind of examination, whether that's um, in an acceptable clinical evidence exam, an ACE exam. So they already had everything they need. Um, they don't need you to show up for an exam. They're just going to review all the documents that were there and they can make a determination and that's good. Or there was, there was a fault that was done in your compensation and pension examination and they have to send you back through the process. And uh, 
typically uh, veterans are, are thrown off by this. At least uh, I've seen it a lot. You know, when they see, oh, I'm getting another CMP, why is this happening? Well, typically your your claim is denied for a reason, and it's because of the CMP. Um, so if if you're getting denied and you're having to go through the process again, it's not a bad thing. It's typically a good thing to go back through the process. And especially if you're working with someone, um, then then you know exactly how to prepare for it, what to expect going in, all of that. That's that's my two cents, Jeff. No, I, I firmly agree. I know the duty to assist, I mean, it's it's mandatory. It's signed into law, right? So that means it's a check by the VA to keep them in check. So I've got a couple of people that I'm working with. I had an individual um, IMO, okay, about an actual event. He he got a medal for it. So the actual event was accounted for in his in his achieve in the the medal. Okay, it was also pictures, personal pictures from the event, and two news clippings. So at least three echelons of evidence. I kid you not. Three months later. It's like they should have just with red denied. And I, I was like, I was, I was a little, I'm going to not going to lie. Y'all I get I get, I get a little into this. This is my, not a job. This is a career. This is a passion. This is, I, I live and breathe this every day because I'm passionate about it. And so advocating for the veteran, I said, all right, let's take a breath, take that tack P not, not terminal air. I'm talking about tactical pause, take a breath and explain it to him. Like you just said, it's okay right? There's a process. We can either submit new evidence as a supplemental, or we can take a look at what they said. We read in the, de they didn't consider everything, anything. So we went back and we looked and they, they, they didn't review the evidence properly and they only considered half of it. Here's why. If you guys read an AMA or the appeals modernization act decision letter, it'll tell you why they did it. And then they'll have favorable findings. And under the favorable findings, it says conceded um, service connection or a, a stressor, right? And he was diagnosed, but they, that's kind of like the halfway saying we recognize it, but not. So I said, all right, you got to do an HLR. You work, you know, Hey, as we've stated before, you, you got our, our names on there for our links. Um, you guys can sign up with us. If, even if you're not like, oh, I'm kind of like half and half do the 30 minute free phone call with us. And what we'll do is a part of our process and a part of our, um, Honestly, our job is to make sure that you have the tools needed to go forward. So in that HLR, breaking it down, basically calling out, hey, this is what we we had this. This is what you said that we disagree with this until that. You know, there's a process. I'm not going to get into it because we don't have that much time left. But that, that could be like another hour and a half, two hour long discussion for the HLR process. You know that. And then they submitted it. And then about a couple weeks later, no kidding. Um yeah, it um, he got a duty to assist error. So he he read the error, and then there's another the anxiety that the, my vet had. He was, oh my god, what do I do? It's there's it's messed up. I was like, no, take another breath. This is okay. This is actually really a good thing. They're just letting you know that they made the mistake. Do I need to send any more? No, you're good. You're good. Just trust me. You're good. So I just wanted to you know provide that one. Um, is David Hale? David Hale, what do you got for us? Uh, did several claims with the VSO several years ago, and I was denied on most of them. Is there a time frame to do an appeal? On the bright side, since joining BACI eight months ago, I went from 20% with the VSO, and since joining, I'm currently at 80. First and foremost, welcome. Glad that you're here. Awesome that you've gotten up to 80%. That's great. That's great. Uh, but the time frame, I'm pretty sure you can, if you get a decision unfavorable, yeah, you got that. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, I, one year from, one year, from yeah. the, the, the date of the decision. Um, okay. And so for for this, um, Jeff and I, we're, we're just kind of talking about mostly higher level reviews. Okay. Um, there is a legacy appeal process, so it goes through the courts. Um, but that's where you're spending years uh, going through the process. And, and, and that takes, uh, ultimately, you're waiting on a court date. Um, you're waiting to work through, working with an attorney. Um, it, it, that process takes a long time. The, going through the medical process, going through the higher level review, um, evidence is ultimately going to, 
uh, dictate the outcome anyways, regardless of, of how, how it works. Um, the advantage to the legacy appeal is you, you're, you're protecting your file date and they'll back pay you all the way, all the way back. Um, but with regard to, with regard to those claims, uh, David, and this is what I say to people, my clients that come with me and, Hey, I've got these things. I want to go for these things. You know, I was denied a, B and C. This is from 2010. And what I tell exactly what, uh, coach Jordan is saying, I say, let's take a look at what we've got. If, if there is credible medical evidence that you have currently, or what do you need? then we can look at that. It's about building the best claim going forward. Sometimes you might just need a nexus. If you have a diagnosis in your blue button, which is the medical record from the VA, and you need to tie that to a primary service condition so you can do a secondary service connection, you know, it, but that also goes back into that SEM method that, you know, us, us, just co us as coaches, excuse me, uh, or entrenadores, uh, as coaches that will guide you on that, right? Then that's the education piece. That's what we're talking about now. So absolutely a great questions. And I appreciate that shout out going from 20 to 80. So if you guys are here, just jumping in, cool. Welcome home. I think this is family. So I love you all. And I appreciate working with you all thus far. Um, I guess I got another question for you, Sean. You know, we were talking about, we kind of got through the HLR, the duty to assist. What about... National Archives. How many times have you heard veterans say, well, they'd say it was a bird dump in a fire. There's probably, I think we have a, a rampant arsonist or something as a matter at the National Archives. What, what's, what about that? Do you know anything about that information, how to get that information? Or if we need, if there's another way, if you don't have that information there, what can be done about that? Yeah. So and unfortunately, and th this impacts a lot of our uh, atomic and Vietnam era veterans and, and, even even our Korea ver veterans, you know, anyone basically who served prior to 1973, uh, there, there was a mass fire, you know, in, in the 1970s that burned down uh, a good chunk of records and the ones that weren't entirely burnt uh, smoke and it, 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 they just destroyed what was there. Um, so it, it becomes it became very difficult to acquire uh, full um all of the records that the VA would need typically to make a render a decision. Um, that being said, not, not all is lost. So when it comes down to it, uh, lay evidence in, in these cases is, is best. Plus there's also a whole list of presumptive conditions um, for, for a lot of these, especially for the Vietnam era veter veterans, which is, is who's in, in my experience uh, most impacted by these fires. Um, that, that's who a lot of who I work with who just doesn't have access to these records. Um, well, thank you to their service, by the way. I know everybody, I'm going to say everybody, thank you for your service. But I mean, I had, I think I had three kin or family I'm trying to use my Eastern Tennessee. I had three family members served that I know that served proudly, proudly in Vietnam, but they were not giving, given what was, I think, due. I don't know so much owed, but due. Uh, to men and women coming back from Vietnam. So thank you for your service and welcome back. If anybody on here, uh, anybody Korea or even World War II, because I know we got some of our World War II brethren and sister and just celebrated two, uh, I just saw two 100-year-old birthdays. So awesome on that. But I would also say with the archives, it, it is an issue. It is an issue because I've got a couple of gentlemen I, that I'm working with right now that experimental aircraft, Air Force type stuff, or even Coast Guard with ops, you know, down in the Caribbean and stuff like that, the clearance issues that you have. I, I know for a fact, like the VA, you authorize them with your private medical records. But if you, if you have information that you petition and say, hey, due to these things, right, you put in there in a statement, like we were talking about the late statements, the 4138. If you put in there, hey, you know, I was aboard this ship at this time during these, th these months, that's enough information to, as a catalyst, to then have the VA go and look for those records, okay? Now, they're gonna do as much as they can. I think what I read last night is they'll try indefinitely until the other person on the other side, I think I said this earlier, uh, the, I'll call them the custodial, custodian of the records, petitions back and saying, hey, we don't have this, or hey, we may have something, I gotta check microfilm, or you know, they were burned badly. I've seen, I've seen records that are microfilm, but you can still see the burn records. 
it's true. That did happen. I, I made that. I don't know if it was an insensitive joke, and I do apologize for saying the rampant arsonist, but uh, the issues that we face as veterans is an issue of records, right? Uh, so what else? Means of reporting. I think, uh, what about this one? I never got a CNP date. What if, what if somebody, they never got a, an advisement letter from the VA stating, hey, we need a, a statement in support of claim, or you didn't fill out your stressor statement, or you know, we need more evidence, right? Have you ever had anybody with the CMP date just not getting anything? I know I've had a couple. <clears throat> For just sure. flat out denied. They, and it was first time filing too, not even a, needing a supplemental or anything, just a first time filing, automatic denial. And, and that's, that, that's, uh, the, the triggers the duty to assist. Good. I know I've got veterans that are like, well, I submitted the IMO and then they, you know, they get, they'll get mad. Like, well, I went to my private doctor. I've done all this and I have, and I get it. You know, I'm a hundred percent permanent total myself. It took me a couple years. Like, I mean, we can get, we'll get into the next, like the next ones. And I think you know where I'm going with this going in from this one. Let's talk about, um, Failure to use uh, required devices or medical exams that we would consider invalid. You know, what's that protractor thing he called? What, what do you what do you think on that? Yeah, yeah. So we'll talk a little bit about the uh, invalid medical examination. So, uh, we're, Jeff, what you're talking about is, is a goniometer. Um, mm. So for your musculoskeletal conditions, that that's the required device. You're uh, for most of these conditions, they're they're based on range of motion. Um, which measures your your degrees of of, of uh, movement from 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 the norm, um, and then they they bend you and move you to the point of discomfort. And so, if you don't use the device, how can you measure that? And so, uh, if you if you're walking into a compensation and pension examination and they're just eyeballing it and they write down a number, that doesn't do you any justice. And no. so. Uh, where, where I would caution veterans and that's where, you know, working with a coach is handy. Um, that's when you want to get on the line, um, with, you know, one of us or, or someone who's got a knowledge of the process. So you can, you can know how to react in that situation because you don't want to wait until you have a decision because it's really hard to contest that. Right. So if they, if they don't use it in the moment, but then they render a decision, you got to be able to prove that, um, you can do it in the moment. So you can go and you can call, uh, either the. Uh, contract your examiner or the VA itself, report it, make it note in your claims file, do a 4138, you know, mm -hmm. do a personal statement to, to document it. Um, or if you brought a spouse in, you can have them do a sworn statement and, and document it as well. There's a few ways to skin the cat on that one. But ultimately, if they don't use the device, you have to be able to prove it at that time before they make the decision. Otherwise, there's no double jeopardy. That's huge what you just said. Working with the coach, knowing the process. Because when I did this myself, here my anecdote for that, and I, I shared it with you earlier briefly, and I'll just share it briefly because we only have a little bit of time, and I want to make sure that we have enough time for all of our fellow br brothers and sisters to say that I was at 40% for my back. I went into an exam for a refile. I'm thinking, hey, a doctor, he's good. Hey, let me help you. Right, the word help is synonymous, at least in my head, with the doctor. I didn't know what was happening meaning a goniometer wasn't used. They pushed me past the point, you know, being a personal trainer, there's a point of strain and pain. I went past both. <laughs> like it was bad. Yeah. I, I, it, it, I didn't know it at the time, but now that and I, now I know the process, um, but it, it worked out. Thank God. But I don't want any of you to have to deal with that, to go through a rating reduction. That's not good. If you guys have, if y'all have, you know, some stuff up here in the gray matter that, you know, trips you out, not like it used to be. We could, you know, we could fight through the pain and all that. But now that we're out of service, we're more in tune with ourselves. It really didn't do good for my anxiety. I could tell you that much. So going through the process, working with the coach, um, get on a discovery call if you all want to. If you're not, hey, I don't want to put all my eggs in a basket. I, you know, I have some questions. Come on. I'll talk with you. Sean, Dr. Sean will talk with you. We have a great company here. We'll guide you through that process. You know, I don't, I don't say, you know, I say coach. Yes, that's my name, but I say God. I like the word God a little bit more because I, I go through the shooter, the, the spotter shooter concept. I was a combat marksmanship coach as a butter bar, a little weird, 
you know, when I was in service, but to take a person that's not able to shoot to a person that can get expert or maybe sharpshooter, that's huge. But I'm, all I'm doing is using my knowledge, using my knowledge of the process. And I want you all to hopefully walk away from today better than you were. And I know Coach, uh, Coach Dr. Sean wants you to do the same thing. Um, and double jeopardy. That's, uh, let's speak on that one. That's an interesting concept to me because I have some individuals that have issues with that as well. Yeah, I, I noticed it a lot. So we, we, we talked about it here, you know, in terms of the denial, but it, it also works in terms, uh, especially for rural veterans, um, mm -hmm. where and it's not always the case, but I, I see it a lot. And you likely do too, Jeff, you know, when it comes to rural vets where you have limited access to providers, mm -hmm. um, where they'll send you back to the same provider where you were previously denied. So that triggers a double jeopardy, right? So ultimately you're not getting your fair shake. You've got someone who either previously denied you or you're, you you got a previous rating from them. The so they rated there. you at whatever percentage. Um, so they're, they're going to look at their own work from, from last time. What's the incentive other than to, to copy and paste? They're going to trust themselves versus, you know, looking and necessarily getting an unbiased view of, of, of the veteran. Um, so that would be a cause for a, a new CNP evaluation. A firm. And that's that word advocacy, right? I know we got rural veterans or, you know, I've, I've had people even living in like Miami Dade or in a big Metroplex area out of all the providers, I've had a couple, they go to the same one that denied them before, you know? Uh, so advocate, 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 just like we used to say, gas, 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 you know, you got to do the same thing here. Cause if you're not looking out, you know, there's only so much I can do with my veterans because, you know, being the phone or zoom based, you know, if I could be there at everything, if I could be there to help and guide and Hey, this is what you got to do. I would, you know, you guys, like I was a Ford observer, right? So there's only so much that I can do from the Hill. I need, there's gotta be boots on the ground. There's only so much that I can see from the Hill. So Agreed. Double jeopardy, not a good thing, especially when, you know, that word bias that we throw out, you don't want that at all. And then we talked about assisted exams. Great on that process is if you're working with us, get with us right away, not a week later, not even the next day. Like my process, my, my law, my rule for myself, hey guys, gals, you're going in for a CMP exam, text me after, take some time, whatever you need to do, because it might be a mental health exam that you may need some time to just relax a little bit. Hey, that's awesome. Take some time, but that day, let me know. Was it good? Was it bad? Okay, if it was bad, how? Okay, if it was bad, how? Let's get on the hook, either the White House hotline, 855 or the 827, uh, 1000 with the VA, and then put in the required paperwork with that 4138 and getting the ball going because I've seen people get same new CMP exams the next day from a bad one. Yes. You're going to have to go through the, you know, you're gonna have to go through it again, but the anecdotal information or the information from a musculoskeletal exam is important and you don't want to wait two or three days on that. So, and I think we may have the last thing that we were going to talk about failure to notify you of required evidence. What do you think on that? Yeah, I, I know we're so we want to leave some time for questions, but mm -hmm. the, the big thing on this, um, the, the VA has an obligation to let you know of exactly what's required for your claim. Um, so we're and veterans, veterans can go awry on this one. So the, the, there's two causes at fault, right? There, there's the VA side of it, which is where they are required to inform you of everything that's required. Um, so I, I typically see this with mental health claims, particularly PTSD. Uh, you're required to, when, when you file for, for post-traumatic stress, you're required to, to fill out a, a form that, that documents your stressor event, which is called a, a VBA form 21-0781. It's just a form that documents where you went, what you did, and how you were, uh, or what was the cause of your stressor. You know, well, what's the thing that keeps you up late at night that uh, causes your mental health symptoms? Um, so the VA can investigate it further. Well, they can they can trigger a CNP exam without it. Ultimately, can, they can bring you all the way through the process and deny it without ever receiving that form. Then you get denied without ever actually getting the form that was required. Um, or the VA can also send multiple requests to the veteran, and and it just doesn't go anywhere. 
Um, so I, I would caution caution veterans on, on both fronts. You know, if the VA is asking you for something, it's usually for a reason. Um, however, when when the VA has not asked you, um, that's where that decision letter is, is key. And that's where having someone to review that decision letter is, is with the knowledge of the process is helpful because you got to be able to pick it apart on what all the requirements are. And if, if, if they didn't do their job, if they like if you filed for something and it was not required through the process and you were denied for a very specific reason, um, that's where you are do a fair shake. Outstanding. No, I like it. I appreciate that. I think that's a great stopping point. I appreciate working with somebody like you, not only serving, but still knowledgeable and passionate about this just the same. So let's get to it. We got about 10 mics for some questions. Um, let's, we got to go all the way back. Wow. This is, that is a lot. Uh, one love Jeff. Well, I, I will say for the group. Yeah. If you have questions for, uh, for Jeff or I, please put them in the chat. And, uh, for the next 15 minutes, you, you got us here. We'll, we'll answer what we can. A lot of California residents. Simplify. Oh, Charleston. I see Sedina. I love Charleston. That's a special spot in my heart down there at the uh, Bulldog Challenge. Beautiful. I love the Bulldog Challenge, Charleston. That was fun. Arkansas. Okay. Okay. We got some Ranger. Mark Perry, USMC. Ra. John Moore. I think you know who he is. Simplify. All right, let's get down to some, have you all heard of this? Please share this with anyone who has had active duty service between 57 retirement. We can get into that. Let's see, any questions? I'm going through the questions, y'all. If you have any new questions, put them on there. So I've got one from okay, the Jones-Lewis family. Okay. Uh, I am trying to get a nexus letter from a doctor for sleep apnea. However, I can't see him for two months due to his workload. Should I wait for another doctor or go sooner? Uh, well, Jones Lewis family, Arkansas. Um, is it so if it's sleep apnea, caution, primary service connection or secondary? And if you're, you know, if you're part of the elite experience that, you know, with us, you have access to Telemedica. Now you know you have to have primary service connection of things that they can connect uh, your sleep apnea to, right? So you get a coach; they'll work with you through that process. So I can't really. The only thing I can say is if it's a doctor that you have or you work with and they have history with you, that's a personal choice. Now, if you're, you know, if you're trying to get somebody to write you a letter, that's you'd have to do the research in your area to see if there is a doctor that can write a DBQ or a Nexus on that. But if you do have a coach, you know, hey, they'll guide you and talk down to target with that one. Yeah, I see Philip has another question here about his uh, PTSD. Okay. I filed. I received. Um, if you don't mind, I could tackle this one. Please do. I got. You. So what, what I would say is if you filed for IU, uh, which is individual unemployability, uh, and it's related to your mental health, yes. I, I, and th there's technicality on this, right? So it depends on when you filed, if you filed. So if you received a rating for PTSD and then you filed for IU and that was recently, then yes. I would anticipate another exam for um, individual unemployability because you, you ultimately have to prove what well, because of your mental health and your mental health symptoms why why, why can you not work um because you're, you're going for that 100 percent, right so that's the, there's a monetary incentive to it but you do have to prove ultimately how you you, you can't work um because of your mental health so they they will trigger the process as a standard form that providers have to fill out when they go um, it, it can, it can be virtual, so you may not have to actually go to an in-person exam, um, but it will, it will trigger another examination. No, I'm good on that one, especially with the IU. I, I get questions all the time on that. Do I have to go to other exams? Yeah. You got to prove, uh, why you are not able to, why you're not at the capacity to work. Um, I do have one here, Dan Ruiz. I've been trying to have my bilateral uh, plantar fasciitis increase from 10 to 30. I've had two CMPs, both mentioned I still have pain after non-surgical, but since both examiners said um, 
I have examiners I have not been recommended for surgery. That's what keeps me at 10, but I've talked to a VA podiatrist about having, but I opted out. Okay, no, that's first and foremost, you're advocating for yourself on why a surgery, an invasive procedure, would not be good for you. A doctor says it would, but you believe and you're outweighing the benefits, cost benefit. It, that's perfect. Do that first and foremost with anything. Now, with regard to why they're denying an increase, that may be a fact that you you may need some, you might need to do that supplemental claim, new and relevant information outside of the VA sphere, right? So if you go to the VA for medical information, great, absolutely do that. I go there whenever I come back stateside, I come back for my annual physical. Um, but if you're doing this, you may need an outside look either from a private doctor writing something that says, you know, according to the CFR 38, right, the, the percentage level, what symptoms at that level, if that doctor, if that's where you are, where you fall, and if that doctor that's seeing you can speak on that and say, uh, you know, Dan, you know, hey, he's got issues, you know, his right foot is this, his left foot is this, there's no, you know, whatever they're saying, if they can provide the rationale as to why it's been aggravated, right? That's the first one you want to show. They want to show aggravation. And honestly, you know, flare-ups or how it, like, occupational, what they call, or if you read it, it says occupational social impairment, right? That's what the VA says, especially with mental health. They say partial or total. So how does it affect you occupationally, right? I can't stand, I can't walk. Or if you're if you're working in a machine shop, I used to work at a machine shop and you're standing in a machine for 10 hours a day, that's painful. And if that's an issue, you need evidence. So you work with a coach, get your evidence, you know, maybe have your boss write a, a statement because your boss can write a statement. You know, Dan was not able to perform duties such as blah, 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 because of this. So it's that quality versus quantity type of evidence that you need to prove why you need to be at that higher level. So if you don't have a coach, Dan, get one quick. Good question, though. We got one here from Todd. Uh, looking to go to uh, permanent and total. Okay. Ah, Puerto Rico. Vives aquí or living in Puerto Rico? I got you. Uh, they're hundred percent for anxiety, depression. Last years, but they told me they cannot put the TNP mark because I am working a full time job. Is that true? Anything you can do? Okay. First, I would say. There's, there's a difference between you want to tackle this one or not, because there's a difference between static and non-static. And a lot of times veterans don't understand or don't know this piece because, well, you don't know what you don't know. You haven't been told this. You need to call the VA. I would call the VA, Todd, call the VA. They may or may not be able to email you your rating, your code sheet. Sometimes they say they can, sometimes they can't. I'm just speaking from a personal experience that I've heard both. So you want to call them up and see if it is static or non-static. The other place I would check would be your benefit summary letter on va.gov. It says your service, what you're being paid at, what you're rated at, and then it will say, is this veteran considered to be permanently in total or whatever it says, whatever configuration, um, disabled? And it will say yes. Um, you just, it may be that you just need to check on that. It could be that that is what you are, or it could also be if it's non static that they want to, cons they're, they're seeing something in their, their continued evaluation of you when you go to your doctor's appointments, right, that there's a reason why they're keeping it non-static, if that makes sense. Yeah, to, to carry on that, on that, so mental health conditions, tip, uh, from, from the VA perspective, right, they're all about symptoms. There's 31 compensatable symptoms of mental health that ultimately rack and stack into your ratings that go from zero to 100. Um, but when it comes down to it, when you're looking for the static, uh, it, one, it, it's time. So you got to have multiple evaluations with the exact same, uh, symptoms over time to prove that mm -hmm. you're just not getting better. Um, that's, that's what's going to be a static criteria for mental health. Uh, but beyond that as well, you, the conditions are, uh, to, to not go chronic conditions typically get better over time. Um, you know, whether it's through medication, treatment, whatever it is um, for, for your program, conditions typically get better over time for uh, different uh, mental health conditions. Uh, in rare instances, do they get worse? But when you're actively going and seeking treatment uh, through through programs and you're, you're getting compensated for what's going on and the VA is, is providing resources for you to get better, typically they see 
um, people get better with mental health conditions. So they're, they're very hesitant to provide the static marker um, for, for those conditions whether it's PTSD, anxiety, depression. Great question. Honestly, God, great. That was a good question because that is a common question or that's a question that I get, but not all the time. All right. We do have, I thought we had more time. I'm not going to lie, but I just got the heads up. Five mics left. Um, let's wrap it up. So, Y'all, we're here with us. We've covered things that can be appealed mainly at the HLR level, right? Not enough evidence, uh, evidence not being considered, uh, the duty to assist, kind of what is a probative value, uh, anything else that I'm kind of forgetting? What we, I'm just trying to recap doing that summation. I'm trying to think of anything else we covered. I think that's about it. Like, oh, the, the tools, incorrect usage of tools during an exam, failure to notify you or you know, an assisted exam if somebody put their hands on you. So that's what we've covered today. Um, you guys know Dr. Sean, you've got my information. Uh, we've covered a wealth of information, especially for los veteranos in Puerto Rico. Dígame su información, tiene mi vínculo o vínculo de entrenador Sean. Um, Let's hear from you. If you guys have any other questions, please reach out to your coach. If you don't have a coach, sign up with us. Um, you can do the, a free 30 minute as well. Talk through some things and we can get down to brass tacks on it all. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else. Do you have anything else, Dr. Sean? You know, the only thing I, I'd say we, we didn't necessarily dive into because we were, we were going for the questions. Um, that's a, a big ticket item regarding particularly invalid medical e examinations is mm -hmm. uh, where they would accept the medical examiner's opinion as fact rather than reviewing the evidence that was there. So we just mm -hmm. we, we see this a lot where, you know, they'll, they'll look at the DBQ and they'll say, OK, well, we, we, we look at our provider's uh, view over whatever evidence you consider. Um, but it, you know your truth um, at, at the end of the day, and I'm speaking to all the veterans out there, you know, you know your truth, you know uh, the disability compensation that you're owed for what's going on, you know the service connection that you're owed for, for what was going on, how it was caused. So what I'll say is, is don't give up. Um, you know, Jeff and I are, are, are walking testimonials. We've all been through the process. We, we know what it's like. You know, it, it's very easy to give up through the process. You can feel frustrated. It can feel daunting. But what I'll say to everyone out there is, is, is don't. Um, this, these processes exist for a reason. Um, keep at it, stay strong. If you need help, we're here for you, but, uh, it's a pleasure to serve Jeff. Great class. It was great, brother. I appreciate everybody here. Um, I really do. I appreciate the topic. These are the topics that we don't talk about a lot. You know, we talk about strategy, education, uh, medical evidence. You know, we also, you guys come aboard, pretty big fan of it. Mental Health Monday. We get three classes a week or a day, excuse me. We have weekly classes. We have these types of classes on different modalities. Um, and it's, it's nice to be able to reach veterans on such a level. Uh, we have coffee with the coaches, 0800 Central Standard Time. That's five hours early in Hawaii because I've had some veterans at work that live in Hawaii. Um, East Coast, we, we reach all around the world. Okay. We get people coming in from all countries, expats, you know, veterans that are living abroad. Uh, especialmente uh, los veteranos de si puede hablar en español. Uh, tenemos mucho entrenadores para ti. Or if we have, if you do not want to work with a male coach, we have female coaches. Um, we have, I think we have, is it a, a female, the female veterans group? Don't they meet as well? Um, we do CMP preparation. There's, there's so many resources here that you, that you'll have fingertip that you have at your fingertips. I didn't have it when I went through. When I did it, it was artillery method, spray and pray, barely any strategy, a lot of evident medical evidence and my own fumbled through uh, education. But, you know, I'm going to say thank, you know, Brian did it. He started a movement a couple years, how many years ago? And now we're a part of that. And it's it's reaching out. It's putting everything, organizing it so you don't have to read through binders of, you know, binders of information. So just. Keep that in mind. If y'all want to come aboard, we're here. All right. Yeah. And, and you deserve it. 
you know, there's a great, great book out there. Great resource. If, mm -hmm. if you're looking to, to kind of do some self-study, great resources are available at your fingertips. Appreciate y'all. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Thanks for your time. Be well.